Hi everyone. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of companies performing bank reconciliations. So let's take a look. All right, first off, the bank reconciliation. What does it involve? What purpose does it serve? Basically, the bank reconciliation is where you take your cash ledger that's maintained within the company, so basically all the transactions that affected cash, and you compare them to the bank statement for your bank account that holds cash. That bank statement shows you cash in and out per the bank. You have a ledger that shows cash in and out per the company. You compare the two, and you do this in order to essentially come to what is an accurate cash balance that you need to be reporting on your financial statements, okay? Now, you may be thinking, well, wait a minute. If, if the bank is tracking all cash in and out and you're tracking all cash in and out, really, they should just always be the same, right? Every, everybody should have the same numbers and it and should all be accurate. And so in an ideal world, that would be true. But in the real world, there are various inefficiencies or potential mistakes that cause one or the other, either the company or the bank, to actually have an incorrect record, okay? And here I list a lot of the reasons why that may be the case, and I'll talk through each one of these. First up, initial balances may not match due to deposits in transit. You'll see me abbreviate this a lot, DIT, deposits in transit. Now, what is a deposit in transit? Well, this is a deposit made by the company, comma, not yet processed by the bank. All right, so what do we mean a deposit made by the company but not yet processed by the bank? Well, let's think about the idea of, say, a night slot or a weekend drop-off slot. Banks tend not to be closed, tend not to be open on Sundays or even the, the late, later half of Saturdays, um, at least in the United States. If a company um, makes a deposit in what they call the night drop at a bank um, during one of the times when the bank is closed, well, the company knows it deposited that money, right? Cash in. But the bank, it's not open. It hasn't processed it. It doesn't know that the company deposited that money. That is what we call a deposit in transit. It is in between the company and the bank. So the company knows about the deposit. The bank doesn't know about the deposit. And in this case, that would create an, an inaccuracy in the bank's record until they finally process that deposit. Now, I use the example of the night slot, but it could be an example of, say, you have an armored car that picks up cash from a specific location. And so once the car takes it, as far as you're concerned, that's a deposit, right? But the armored car is going to make its rounds. And until it gets to the bank, um, again, deposit literally in transit, right? There's various reasons that this may come to be, but basically deposit made by the company, not yet processed by the bank. An outstanding check, you'll often see me abbreviate this OC. Outstanding check, well, this is a very similar situation. This is a check written by the company, not yet processed by the bank. All right, so how does this happen? Well, if you think about the process of writing checks, the logistical process of writing a checks, a check, you literally have a checkbook, and or in the case of companies, maybe it's a check printer, right? But either way, you have a, a, a physical check that gets filled out that says, to other company, here's how much this check is worth. And so when that other company takes that check to their bank, their bank will electronically communicate with your bank, confirm the funds exist, and transfer that money from your account to whoever you gave the checks to account. Think about that logistically. That takes time, right? There's time lag. From the moment you write the check, at which point, as far as you're concerned, you've written a check, credit the cash account, right? From that moment, all the way until whenever the person you gave the check to actually gives it to their bank, Whenever their bank actually processes it, communicates with your bank, and your bank finally does transfer those funds over to the other bank, that entire time, your bank is unaware that you wrote a check. And so, again, there's a discrepancy where the bank is going to be inaccurate here for that amount of time, up until the point that they transfer the funds. You wrote a check. You know you wrote a check. The bank doesn't know it yet, and so it's not in their record yet. It creates a discrepancy between your record and theirs. Okay. 
Next up, electronic fund transfers, or EFTs. Electronic fund transfers are transfers directly, boy, wrote that one really poorly. Let's try that again. Directly to or from bank account, okay? What's the situation here? Well, if you think about it, the company is not involved in the EFT. The company has set it up to where money can either go straight to their bank account, an EFT deposit, or straight out of their bank account, an EFT payment, without them actually taking action or even being aware of it. So to the extent that the company has electronically received money on behalf of the company or electronically paid money on behalf of the company, the company may not know about it and therefore it may not be in the cash ledger. This creates an inaccuracy on the company's books. Okay, let's talk about a bounce check or what we call an NSF. NSF stands for non-sufficient funds. An NSF check is a check where there's not enough money in the bank account to cover it. Now, this could be that the company wrote a check and the company didn't have enough money in their bank account. It could be that the company received a check from a customer and the customer didn't have enough money in their bank account, right? There's two different ways that this could happen. But either way it occurs, what it means is there wasn't enough money to cover the check. Therefore, the check, what they call bounces, it doesn't get processed, it gets denied, okay? Now, why this creates a discrepancy is because as far as the company knows, the check was good, right? The company either writes the check, gives it out, they think it's good, or the company gets a check, deposits in their bank account, they think it's good. The bank knows whether the, the, the check was good or not, and the bank is the one that bounces it. So the bank record will be accurate, but the company's cash ledger will not be in this situation. Then you've got a few other things, bank fees, all right? Now, bank fees are self-explanatory. Um, it's a fee that the bank charges the company, charges to the company's account directly. Sometimes this happens for overdraft protection. Sometimes this happens as part of just a business account, uh, uh, a periodic service fee, uh, something of that nature. Again, this is a situation just like the EFTs or the bounce checks. The bank knows it has pulled money out of the company's account. So the bank record is correct. The company doesn't know about it, right? It's not in the cash ledger because this happened without the company having to record anything. So again, a bank fee is a situation where bank record is right, company record is not. And then of course you have errors. Now of course, errors, self-explanatory, one party screws up. Either the bank messes up your, your deposits or your checks, or you mess up your deposits or your checks. Either way, um, whoever messes up, their record is, of course, going to be wrong. All right, so that's a description of all the ways that things could go wrong. Now let's see how this plays out in terms of reconciling and coming to a proper balance. So here we go. Um, the reconciliation procedure requires you to essentially establish two pieces of information. One is what we're gonna call the bank side or the bank information one which we're gonna call the company side or the company information or, or also known as the books, as you see I have written here, the books, right? So we have bank side with company side. And so what happens here is you start off on both sides with the cash balance that each side thinks the company has. So in the case of the bank statement, what balance does the bank think you have. In the case of the company, what balance does your cash ledger show? And it is worth pointing out here that this is the ending cash balance, right? Because what you're trying to determine here is what is the correct cash for your financial statements? And specifically, if you think about your balance sheet, that is the balance at the end of the period. So even though this is the number we start with, it is technically the ending cash balance, what the bank thinks you have, what your books, your own ledger thinks you have. That's what you start with. Now, on the bank side of things, to the extent that there was a deposit that the company knew about and the bank hasn't processed yet, you're going to have to add that 
to the bank balance, right? Think about it. It makes sense. It's going to get processed. It's going to increase your bank balance. It just hasn't happened yet, which means that the bank balance is too low. And so you just add that amount to it, and that will help fix that. Similarly, to the extent that the company has written a check and the bank hasn't taken that money out of the account yet, subtract that from the bank balance because the bank balance is too high. And then I have on here bank errors, and I have plus or minus. And that's because every error is unique, but to the extent that the bank made a mistake that overstates your cash, subtract that. To the extent that the bank made a mistake that understates your cash, add that back, right? So you have to fix the error that the bank made on the bank side. Once you do this, the bank side should, if you didn't make any mistakes, tell you what your correct cash balance is. Now, you're not going to stop there and just assume you didn't mess up. You're now going to go over to your side and you're going to do a similar set of adjustments and see if you can come out to a matching balance. On the company side, again, take the ending cash balance from the ledger. To the extent that the bank collected any money on your behalf digitally that you were unaware of, you add that back. To the extent that the bank paid anything digitally on your behalf, subtract that from your balance. Again, these are situations where the bank took action that you haven't recorded in your cash ledger, so you're not aware of them, so you need to make these adjustments. To the extent that you wrote a check that bounced, right? You thought money left your account. The check bounces, so the money doesn't really leave. Add that back. To the extent that you received a check, so you debited cash. You thought you got paid by a customer, but that check bounces. Subtract that because you didn't really get it. To the extent that you received any sort of bank fees or other service charges that reduced your bank account balance, subtract that as well. You haven't recorded that. That just happened automatically. And then just like the bank, to the extent that you made any errors, fix that in the appropriate direction. If your error made your cash balance too high, subtract it. If your error made your cash balance too low, add it back. And once you make all of those adjustments, you should come out with the correct balance on the company side as well. And of course, your final check is, do you have the same balance on both sides? Okay. If you do, you can be pretty confident that things are okay. Now, two points I just want to hit on before we wrap this up. First of all, the question I get a lot is, wait a minute, all this stuff that you were talking about, you said, well, the bank knows about it. Um, but you don't. So, so how do you know about it to be able to do this reconciliation? Well, that's where the bank statement comes in. The bank is going to periodically issue a statement showing you their record of the activity in your account. Every time you get that statement, that's when you sit down and do this process. And therefore, you can figure out, okay, what is our true cash balance? Because now you have both sets of information. You have your internal information. You have the bank's internal information that's when you can do your reconciliation. So you typically do it at the end of an accounting period and you do it based on having the bank statement in your hand at that point. The other thing I wanna point out is this note down here. Errors may affect other adjustments. So you'll see on here um, that company errors um, and bank errors have to be fixed on the side of the, the party that screwed up, right? You have the, the party that screwed up, you have to change the balance on that side to fix it. Um, to the extent that an error involved a deposit or, a, a, or a, a check written, that could affect your calculation of what deposits were in transit or what the outstanding checks were, okay? And so you just have to keep that in mind. Whenever you're calculating these two items, deposits in transit and outstanding checks, ask yourself, did either party make a mistake with the deposits or the outstanding checks? Therefore, you can fix the mistake then calculate was there a discrepancy in the deposits that the company says they had versus what the bank says they had, so forth and so on. All right, that's obviously a lot to absorb. I don't have a practice problem in this lecture because this was just kind of the, let's introduce you to the various components, but I will have a practice problem video, probably multiple practice problem videos that will let you try this um, for yourself and, and walk through this process. So with that said, I hope you found this introduction to the performing the bank's reconciliations helpful, and I hope you join me for another video.